Richard DiMarci is Cox Distinguished Professor of Biochemistry and Gill Chair in Biomolecular Sciences at Indiana University. Uh, for over three decades, Professor DiMarci has contributed significantly to peptide and protein sciences in academia, pharmaceutical industry, and biotechnology companies. His work at Eli Lilly spanned two decades. He has founded multiple companies as startup companies. He has also served as advisor to various uh, venture capital firms. He's recognized for the dis discovery and development RDNA um, Humalog, which goes with the trade name of uh, Lispro Human Insulin. His most recent exciting work involves uh, a treatment for diabetes. As you know, in the United States today, we have about 29 million uh, diabetics and another 86 million in pre-diabetic stage, which means that within five years, if they are left untreated, one third of them will end up in diabetic state as well. This is a major health crisis. Their work involves development of a new peptide, uh, integrating three gastrointestinal hormones that subsequently target three separate receptors. The outcome of the, their work is uh, enhanced insulin action, reduced blood glucose, increased rate of calorie burning, and improved liver function. Uh, Their the work is currently um, uh, at the stage of human clinical trials and it's managed by Roche Pharmaceuticals. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor DiMarci. Well, thank you so much for the, uh, for the kind uh, introduction. It, it truly is uh, a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Let me congratulate all of the, uh, the fellows. When you look through this book of 2014 fellows, it's a, it's a who's who of, uh, of technology, the breadth, the depth. Uh, it's truly uh, a spectacular and, and well-deserving. Um, I was asked to, um, to provide this lecture long before I became one of the, uh, the, the, the fellows, and I was glad to do it. And I was struggling with what to present, and I've assembled a few slides that capture the nearly 40-year journey through a pharmaceutical company, through academics, through startup biotechnology companies. I, I, I hope that you find some pleasure with what I have here. If it in any way disturbs anyone, it's not meant to be, but there are some controversial points here. The cover slide is sort of a, a photo album of my molecular family, things that I've been closely associated with. And I'm not going to bore you with the technical details of the discovery and the development of these entities, but they're clearly important medicines, most of them uh, now uh, sold by Eli Lilly and company and represents about uh, six billion dollars worth of annual sales and, and many millions of people each day that are using these, these drugs. The title might have captured your attention and it really is what I'd like to discuss this, this morning. John Jordan was the one who quoted that innovation is the pirate ship sailing into the yacht club. And that always stayed with me as to what does that mean? And here you see Keith Richards and Johnny Depp and this question of who are we and why do we do what we do? And what I'd like to share with you, to some people we are good witches and to some people we are bad witches. That change creates anxiety. And I learned this very early on in the, my training. I was at a um, scientific conference, still as a graduate student, in the in the late 70s in uh, hearing uh, Herb Boya talk about the emergence of biosynthesis and the uh, creation of the first peptide somatostatin, if you go back to that, that, that era. And I was just completely mesmerized because I knew the difficulty of doing what he was doing at a chemical level, forget the biochemical approach. And as we went out to coffee break, what shocked me was the discussion of this is terrible. These guys are going to put us out of business. 
in essence, technology was creating an insecurity. And it, it was amazing to me how I've seen that repeated throughout my career and how behaviors are influenced by people's sense of security. By the way, biotechnology created more employment for peptide and protein chemists than they ever created for themselves. So it was actually a very, very good thing. Now this is uh, my recollection of my days back at Lilly, which were absolutely spectacular. The education you get in a pharmaceutical company about discovery and developing drugs can only occur in a pharmaceutical company. Okay? You may not agree with that, but that was certainly my learning and the exposure that I had at an early period to the late stage development has influenced the way I've gone about doing this. But I always felt like an outsider. In fact, repeatedly challenged with why can't you make a real drug? meaning an oral drug, right? Not an injectable drug. And a little known secret is that within 10 years of Lilly's first development of recombinant human insulin, which I proudly was a significant part of, they terminated the future development of any biosynthetic products. Now fortunately, pirates don't take direction. <laughs> and we just continue to push on and do what we have, have done. Uh, and thankfully, in the course of the last 10 years, no one has ever asked me whether I can make a real drug because the world has come to embrace these large molecules as molecular medicines. And here is an example of the last um, macromolecules that I proudly was a part of at, at Lilly, championing its development, despite the fact that we did not have a patent on the chemical entity itself. This is Forteo, the N-terminal 34 residue fragment of parathyroid hormone. And what you're looking at is the bone structure of a single patient after almost two years of therapy, 20 micrograms per day, incredibly potent. If you were taking Prozac, you'd be at 20 milligrams per day, right? 1,000 times the, uh, the weight. And what you're seeing is that the bone structure of this one woman whose fracture rate had significantly decreased. The phase three study showed a 90% decrease in fracture. But in this one patient, you could not you could not decipher her bone structure from her daughter of 30 years younger. In essence, in two years, at $5,000 worth of cost, you could get a new skeleton. Now imagine if that regenerative property could be reproduced for a failing kidney, a failing pancreas, a failing heart, a failing brain. Right? This is what keeps us moving. But we're in our infancy in terms of how to do this, and none of us, certainly not I, expected this sort of phenomenal uh, outcome, which has had a significant uh, effect on the treatment of osteoporosis. Okay, so here's Eli Lilly. I spent 22 years there, left as a, uh, a global uh, executive for all of, uh, of biotechnology, and I'd sit from my office on the left-hand slide looking down this mall and often wondering how did we get to be where we, we are and how much of what we're accomplishing is me versus the other 30,000 employees. And you'd look back at these historical photos and you'd often wonder, which of these two institutions were the more innovative institution? The one that gave rise to the institution on the left or the one that is the left at the point in 2000? And I often jokingly looked at those folks in the doorway and wondered, which is the CEO, which is the CSO to this, this organization? But in fact, this is where real invention occurs. Brian Malloy, who discovered Prozac, often said to me, the critical mass in real invention isn't measured by the number of people working on the problem. It's the number of wrinkles on a single brain. It's the person who actually has that inspirational thought. Sure, you need many, many folks to bring this forward. And I always wanted to go off and, and do this sort of thing. Here's what the industry looked like in 1990. You probably know it well. This was the top 45, 46 companies in the industry. And indeed, this is what it looks like in 2010. As a result of consolidation, mergers, acquisitions, and poor business thinking, quite frankly. Um, you know, plague only wiped out one in four. <laughs> that tells you what the magnitude of the effect has been a change in this industry. Now, for those of you who've lived your whole life in academics, take note. 
we're confronting the same phenomena. People are asking the same questions as to where is the return on investment? Be prepared for traumatic changes as we go forward. And I will share with you, there'll be many people who are resisting the very things we need to do to make this a healthier environment. So there's the question, right? what to do? And this is what got us to where we were in the pharmaceutical industry. This persistent belief that we could just iterate our way forward is captured on this one slide that demonstrates about 150 years of innovative prog progress in British and Swiss pocket watches. Whereas the commercial incentive was simply to get it smaller, to get it, get it lighter, so it was more convenient to wear in a coat, coat pocket. And this particular quote sort of captures what I want to share with you, and that is good ideas and decisions have expiry dates. They're not good forever. The British created a civil service job in 1803 calling for a man to stand on the cliffs of Dover with a spyglass. He was supposed to ring a bell if he saw Napoleon coming. The job was abolished in 1945. <laughs> right? Change comes slowly and people are incredibly resistant. So I often wonder when we are, we are, we are just fertilizer and people look back at this period as to what they will think of this period. And this wasn't that long ago, actually, what is it, 15 years ago, when Time Magazine had the audacity to state these were the 10 most influential people of the last millennium. And uh, I wouldn't know where to begin, but as I looked at this list, it just struck me as highlighted in red that as we moved to the end of the millennium, we were seeing the emergence of technologists as opposed to Elizabeth I, Genghis Khan, William the Conqueror, right? And it just demonstrates the power of what innovation can do. Now, I've often said that the last century was a century of physical sciences, chemical sciences, material sciences, physics. This century, to me, is a century of biology. It's because we know so little about biology, what it represents, disease, health, and how to intervene, the very heterogeneity that within this room that we don't capture within animals. And you could hypothesize who will be that 11th person for this century. Um, I think it's going to be a neuroscientist. You know, what is the molecular basis of a memory? How do we acquire information? How do we deposit it? How do we use it? How do we lose it? 1929, Lindbergh crosses the Atlantic. 40 years later, we're on the moon. Right? Many of you, like me, as graduate students, learned with a slide rule. I wouldn't even know how to use one of those things today, right? You know, where is the picket company that actually produced those slide rules? You know, they certainly weren't welcoming of Microsoft. And so, this is, I think, the seminal event that people will look back to this period and say, what happened that was so dramatically different that changed life as we know it on this earth, which is a stretch, admittedly, and that is the sequencing of the genome. Look at that. That's the tsunami of genomic information that we have acquired in an infinitely small period of time that is dramatically enriching our ability to understand biology. And so this slide is meant to try and capture what that means. We all know what the reflective microscope represented in our understanding of biology. It's the launching of microbiology, the ability to see things that we previously could not see. The electron microscope, the launching of cell biology, the ability to see inside a cell and understand the organizational structures that make a cell a functional unit. This availability of information in the last panel really represents the advent of molecular biology. Sure, Watson and Crick, 1953, I get it, right? But that was structural information. We're now getting to a point where we have biological information. We're talking about, about function. And this slide just demonstrates the difficulty of trying to take this complexity of human biology and translate it into industrial R&D that has fixed budgets, fixed timelines to try and do something that's as audacious as 
curing Alzheimer's disease, diabetic ret retinopathy and the like. Now this, this slide and humor can work for many things, Republicans, Democrats, women, men, right? <laughs> um, there's the first biosynthesis of human insulin, right? We waited 60 years to get to this material, and in most instances, people viewed this as an ending. This was nature's human sequence. How could you do any more than that? And I had always viewed this as a beginning, because we had the technology now to make things that didn't exist in nature. And Humalog became that first substance using biotechnology to create something that was superior to what nature itself had created. And it was a huge challenge because it was viewed as being so iconoclastic. What is it that makes you think that you can design something that's superior to what nature has designed over the eons? And the simple answer is nature selects for physiology. We select for pharmaceutics. It's a completely different environmental pressure, related but different such that you come out with a, a different answer. But I can tell you on the heels of that, the fellow who discovered Nalfon said, wonderful, now we can go back to discovering drugs the right way, meaning small conventional molecules, because he wasn't prepared to give room for the macromolecule medicinal chemistry. And I left Lilly in 2003 to team with Pete Schultz. This is his technology, academic technology, that he developed first at Berkeley and later at Scripps to build a company called Ambrex, off the amber codon RX for the pharmaceutical nature of it, to include non-native amino acids where the microorganism is doing the synthesis. I call it chemical biotechnology. It's the fusing of the fume hood with the lamina flow hood to do things that we just can't do in nature. Now, for anyone who's taken organic chemistry, you know the importance of a ketone, right, for chemical functionality. So in many ways, I had viewed this as adding letters to the alphabet. And you might say, who needs that? <laughs> we already got 26. But we have five vowels. And when you start adding vowels, they make a difference. And this has allowed us to do things such that we can go about adding function or turbocharging function that already exists in nature and in this nature uh, editorial in 2007 playing off of pimp my ride, pimp my antibody, the ability to add cytotoxics, to add uh, radionucleotides and the like to give new function. And the beauty of all of this as achieved at Ambrex is that you can now bioexpress a native <coughs> human antibody of high complexity. We know what the structural complexity is, and with great precision, attach a cytotoxic to the point where you wish it to attach, because in medicinal chemistry, it's very much like real estate. Location, location, location. It makes all the difference in the function of the molecules. Now, simultaneous to starting that uh, uh, laboratory, um, the company uh, Ambrex, I began a laboratory at Indiana University, and this is a picture that was taken in 2009 of the roughly two dozen uh, scientists, students, postdocs that I've been working with, and I'll tell you a bit about the story of what we discovered there. And it takes me back to my roots in uh, metabolism, diabetes, obesity, and the epidemic that was mentioned in the, the introductory comments. We have yet to fully appreciate what this all represents. When you look at the face of that one young lady who I think was 15 years of age, in essence, we've taken maturity onset diabetes, which occurs with a prevalence well more than 10 times juvenile onset diabetes, and turned it into a childhood disease. The ramifications of the microangiopathies, the nerve disease, the eye disease, the kidney disease are gonna show themselves when these children start to appear at ages of 25 and 30 and 35. So we are in the, the incubation period. And one of the things that I wanted to do that was viewed as incredibly uh, pedestrian and unnecessary was to develop a better glucagon. Glucagon is a substance that is used as an antidote for insulin overdose. Uh, you're, give yourself too much insulin, your blood glucose is low, you use a glucagon to, to rescue yourself. And while you're unconscious, you take out this little chemistry kit, 
that is a lyophilized powder, a diluent, you dissolve it, put it in a syringe and give yourself an injection. 90% of the patients who need it don't even have it with them at, at the time because they wouldn't be able to, to, to use it. And in wanting to do this at Lilly, there was no interest because the sales of glucagon were about 200 million, the sales of insulin were 10 billion, right? Where would you spend your time if you were a businessman? When we presented this problem to the JDRF, they said it was unnecessary. Three years later, after rejecting us, they sent out RFPs for this very proposal. And in essence, what we found is that if we just extended the C-terminal end of this peptide, glucagon, we could create something that had dramatically increased solubility such that you wouldn't have to dissolve it at the time of injection because it would be soluble, stable, ready to be used, much like an epinephrine uh, pen. But here's where the really interesting part of all of this occurred. I asked my, my good colleague, Matthias Chupp, if he would put this into rodents and compare its behavior to a related protein, which is this Gila monster peptide, Ascendant 4, that is the active ingredient in Bietta, and it had been known to lower body weight, and lo and behold, glucagon was every bit as effective in lowering body weight as that active ingredient in the pharmaceutical. And it did it in lean animals, and it did it in obese animals, and it did it without creating a diabetic state. And from that, to make a long story short, we hypothesized that we could begin to build polypharmacy, two activities in one, get the best of both worlds, in fact, more than the best of both worlds, that there was a real synergy in suppressing appetite and stimulating therm thermogenesis. And indeed, we published in 2009 this seminal paper that demonstrated that these peptides uh, lowered the body weight, uh, that it improved their blood glucose, that it lowered their lipids, cholesterol, Merck licensed the program, and it's in clinical trial as we, we speak. Barbara Hansen, who's here, did some seminal monkey uh, experiments demonstrating that this wasn't just rodent uh, ph pharmacology. And through all of this, what we found is long in the shade, glucagon reoccupies center court. We learned something about glucagon. We didn't even know about its physiological action. We were so focused on its uh, diabetogenic uh, uh, effect. And um, it just demonstrates that we don't know what we think we know, and that it's very um, serendipitous how we make discoveries that lead us to where we go and why universities are unbelievably important in doing this type of work. It's not going to happen in large pharmaceutical companies. It won't happen in biotech companies until you first demonstrate the signal. And so from this, I jokingly have called this a pipeline within a molecule, with people looking for molecules within a pipeline, because we have made co-agonists of multiple hormones. We've published the triple agonist, which has exquisite e efficacy in lowering body weight, uh, and also using these peptides to target nuclear hormones like estrogen, testosterone, uh, androgens, uh, as well as adjunctive therapy with proteins that have failed, but we know are involved in human regulation of body weight. And so from all of this, uh, I just share with you a piece of data where uh, the hormone leptin, which was discovered by Jeff Friedman at the Rockefeller in 1994, that really had a seminal change on our understanding of, of obesity as a metabolic disease, doesn't work in obese rodents when you treat them with pharmacological doses. And that's true of humans as well. And so the, the conundrum is, why does it work in a normal body weight and not in an excess body weight? And what you see here is when we take these animals and we treat them with our best di uh, coagonists and lower their body weight to a certain point, that the presence of the leptin now is effective in further lowering uh, bo body weight. And by the way, you cannot achieve that just by starving the animals to this point. So it isn't just the reduced body weight. There is something pharmacological about these coagonists that restore leptin responsiveness. So look, these are the folks that I remember when I was a graduate student. Uh, how many of you would turn over your 401k plan to them to uh, 
determine your retirement, right? The young do not know enough to be prudent. It's phenomenal working with young people. And of course, many of you will recognize this as the Microsoft Corporation, right? There's Bill Gates, there's Paul Allen. These are the people that we went to school with all the facial hair. And these are the folks that are changing the world, right? Think about what they have meant to, to communications. The last point I'll just leave you with is this important of diversity. Um, when we select for our labs, when we select for our medical schools, when we select for our programs, we want docs and docs and docs and docs, and we are monoliths. I have advised the Swiss companies that I have consulted for, Novartis and Roche, that they're at a disadvantage. Because when I go through their labs, I don't see Asian scientists, okay? The real great strength of the United States is in the diversity that we have in our laboratories. And yes, having young, dopey people who ask silly questions stimulate us to inventions that we otherwise wouldn't have. Having people that are impossible to deal with have a way of creating the future. And yes, indeed, there is a value to sleep <laughs> if you're going to be, be creative. Thank you very much for the opportunity to. What do I do on time? <laughs> sure. Six years at Purdue University. As I remember well. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it take industry so many years to come up with something when in academia you see people like Bob Langer and I mean I mentioned one with well, no name, they go out every year and they say, We discovered this, we discovered that, you know. And I brought up Bob Langer because I know he worked with Eli Lilly and so on, and he is a very respect, a respectable investigator. Are we a little bit clownish? We are, because I'm going to be talking about insulin in a few minutes. And you guys are more careful, or because you work directly with the patient, you are a little bit. So let me, let me, let me answer in, in two ways. Large, large institutions have this uh, sort of egalitarian behavior that before someone can get two or three, everybody has to have one. That is, we have to treat everybody fairly. I remember a program at Lilly late in my, uh, my tenure there. It was, came from the human resources called Pay for Performance. And I couldn't help but ask, so what the hell were we paying for the first century? Um, and in truth, the answer was peace, that the industry had such incredible margins that you could run it more like a bank than like a pharmaceutical company. And I often noted, um, that the debate at Lilly was there was an excess of ideas. And it's no different at Merck or Roche where I have been, been, been consultants. Um, there's an excess of ideas. And so the constant debate was when you brought something creative forward, your idea is stupid. It's not going to work. You're going to waste our, our precious resource, our time, our money, so on and so, and so, and so forth. Jumping over to a university, I've never had that problem because I bring the money, <laughs> okay? I'm in the outside world. I have to raise the money. Somebody is willing to do that. But here's a word of caution for uni universities. There are at least as many people at the university as there were at Lilly telling me what not to do, telling me how when we're successful, we're going to get screwed. <laughs> we are a not-for-profit and when all of a sudden we start generating revenues, how is that going to be, be reviewed? So the compliance issues are overwhelming, all right? almost suppressive. And so we have got to find a more creative way to promote what we're doing here because as we all recognize, what our state institutions, because they were funded by local governments, are no longer funded by local governments to the extent to allow them to function, right? <laughs> they're not even state-supported institutions. They're state-located institutions. You're very much dependent upon raising enough capital to maintain the quality of education that we all want to, to, to provide. And this is all part of this change that I see needing to occur within a university setting, much as I saw 20 years ago, that took hold in a, uh, 
in uh, an industrial setting. There are far, far more people around playing defense than playing offense, and you folks are part of the offense, right? You want to create the, the, the future.